Chaucy eyes and pull like a dog. <laughs> and a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam Maguire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we kick things off this week, I'd just like to give a gentle reminder as always to our listeners and viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. On this week's podcast, we'll be joined by Cork Ladies football captain Duran O'Sullivan following their All-Ireland semi-final win over Galway on Sunday. Though the game itself was somewhat routine, the build-up and aftermath were anything but with venue changes, frozen pitches, broadcast mix-ups and embarrassing Morning Ireland appearances all thrown in for good measure and Jer McCarthy will join us to break down what went on on one of the most bizarre all-Ireland semi-final days in living memory. We're also chatting to Cork and Nemo Rangers legend Paul Kerrigan, who announced his inter-county retirement last week. Kerrigan was a member of the Cork team that claimed the 2010 All-Ireland title, and he spoke to Kieran about his stellar club and inter-county career that also included four Munster titles and four National League titles. But Kieran, let's jump straight in with the Cork ladies. We'll hear from Jur in a few minutes about the chaos that ensued over the weekend. But before that, you caught up with Darren O'Sullivan, who has led this Cork side to yet another All-Ireland final. We're joined on the podcast now by Cork senior football captain Darren O'Sullivan to look back on a, on a great win for Cork against Galway in last Sunday's All-Ireland semi-final. But we have forced Darren to talk about, I suppose, what went on before the game, the kind of... the. In the run-up to, to this semi-final, there was the venue switch from the Gaelic grounds to Parnell Park. Then, a couple of hours before the game itself on Sunday, a late switch again from Parnell Park to to Croke Park. Um, when did you first learn on Sunday morning that you were heading to Croke Park and not Parnell Park? Um, I suppose one of our selectors came in and told us we had two minutes um, until the bus was leaving. So just to go to the toilet or do last-minute um, organising and then Efi came in and he told us that the match had changed from Parnell Park to Crow Park and that the time had also changed from half one to one o'clock throwing. Um, so he told us that at half 11. Um, so we were kind of set to leave at that stage. Um, we were getting a shuttle bus um, from par- from the hotel, from the Clayton Hotel to Parnell Park. Um, and then initially, I suppose, as you said, like with the earlier venue change in the week, um, we actually initially thought Ify was messing. Um, I thought we just thought he was trying to lighten the mood and make a joke of it that they brought us from Limerick to Dublin and now from Parnell Park to Crow Park. So we actually initially did genuinely think he was messing. Um, but then his his facial expression um, quickly informed us that he was he was dead serious. How did that affect preparation? So not only was it a different venue, but it was an earlier throwing time as well. Yeah, I suppose for anyone who's involved at sport in sport at a high level knows that match day is down to the every detail. Um, every minute, I suppose, is accounted for. Um, like when you have time to do mobility, um, foam rolling, strappings, um. I suppose pre-match meal, um, down to going to the toilet every minute is accounted for. So um it did it did throw us slightly. Um now I must say um our management team coped absolutely unbelievably with it. Um Michelle Dole, um our strength and conditioning coach, um just was unbelievable on the day when I actually look back. Um it, it kind of was surreal. It was a bit of an outer body experience. Like, is this actually happening? Um, but our management team just pressed reset. Um, they were really, really calm. Um, just gave us simple instructions, literally what we're doing in the next five minutes, what we're doing in the following five minutes. So I just think um, it did calm us down. Um, having that calm environment um, and having management with such experience really stood to us on the day um, because it, it, we could have um, let that affect our, our performance. 
Before we look at the game in more detail, um, in a broader note, is there a big learning to be taken from what happened over the last week or so, Darren, kind of with the LGFA and so on, that something like this doesn't happen again because this is an All-Ireland semi-final, one of the biggest games of the year, and with such a late venue change, and in the fact it wasn't even shown on TV, you know, so which was probably kind of gutting for, for players and fans alike. So do you think there's a big learning that everyone can take from this? Definitely. Um... I suppose the LGFA have come and ladies football have grown and um, improved so much in the last, I suppose, 10 years, especially um, in terms of attendance, participation amongst young girls, um, media coverage, um, everything was going in the right direction. But unfortunately, at the weekend, um, following the fixtures, I suppose, clash and uh, camogie and football clash and then um, our match being moved venues and time, um, it does feel like we've taken um, five steps backwards. Um, and I am, I suppose, supporting the LGFA in terms of all the work they do. But last weekend's mix up will have to be um, analysed. Um, I suppose looking back on it now, it was treated as if it was a challenge game, um, changing the venue so late, um, like we were out on the pitch then. Um, for a one o'clock throw-in, and Efi roared across to us that it was now a ten past one throw-in. Um, so stuff like that does take away from an All Ireland semi-final. Um, and as you said, um, us the t match not being on TV was hugely disappointing. Um, it wasn't until afterwards we realised it wasn't on TV, and straight away I was just thinking of of mum and dad at home. Um, I don't think they've missed any of my matches um, since I started playing football, whether it was club or county. Um, they've gone to every match they could, and if they couldn't, they were watching it um, on TV or on Facebook Live, and it was hugely disappointing for them. I, like, I, me and Kira rang them on the way home, and we were trying to recreate um, the match for them and what we did well, what we need to improve on, and but it's not the same. Um, and I did genuinely feel sorry for our friends and family who couldn't watch the match. Um, it's one of the biggest days in our sporting career, um, and it was disappointing, to be honest. What's almost been lost this week as well, Darren, is the fact that, that Cork won that game, 217 to 13 points, or truth in All-Ireland final against Dublin on December 20th, which is brilliant. It's something great to look forward to uh, the weekend after this. Talk me through the, the game against Galway. What were the big positives that, that Cork can take from that and bring into the final? Yeah, I suppose, as you said there, we're in the headlines for all the, the wrong reasons. Um, you'd nearly forget that we actually won the match and that we have an All-Ireland final to look forward to. Um, Look, I was actually more um, happy with our performance um, than anything from the day. Um, management asked us to do certain things and to tick certain boxes. And every girl, the starting 15 and the five who came on, every girl went out there and did that. Um, I suppose one, one take-home message was our, was our work rate. Um, uh, we just worked extremely hard all over the field. Um, we made it really hard for the the Galway defenders to come out with the ball and and slow down their attack as well. Um, so from 1 to 20 and our whole panel, I suppose, just worked really, really hard. Um, and that's something that we were really happy with. And we realised we're going to have to do that um, in two weeks' time again against Dublin. Do you feel you're building with every game, from the Kerry game to the Kevin performance, from Kevin out to, to beating Galway, that every game you're getting better and better? Yeah, I suppose um, our management team are excellent in the, that they set goals for us, um, say a tackle count or um, a shot selection, just different kind of targets for us to meet every match. And we have been meeting those targets. And I suppose in Kerry, I say, just say it was 50% against Cavan, maybe up to 60%. And we are, we are going the right direction. Um, I suppose we're just trying to learn from every game um, and I think the, the competition for places both on the panel and on the team um, makes every girl work that extra bit hard. I suppose you realise that if I'm not doing my job, there's a girl on the sideline who, who can do it. So um, it is, um, you're kept on your toes um, with that competition on the panel. With Paddy O'Shea on the podcast last week and he was saying the exact, exact same thing. He said the competition for places is crazy in the Cork panel at the moment. And if you look at the, look at the Cork attack, Duran, there's yourself, Kira, Orla Finn, Anya Terry, Sierra Noon, and um, there's so many options there. Like kind of, even to get on, 
to get on the, the Cork Saturn 15 is almost an achievement in itself at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we've 38 girls on our panel and we can only name 30, which is obviously hugely disappointing for those eight girls who aren't named. Um, thankfully, they got to travel um, at the weekend, um, which was a huge um, boost for the rest of the team um, that we were going there with our full squad. Um, but as you said, the, the competition for places is, is vicious. Like um, you can't, no matter how many say, Kira, Orla Finn, um, how many All-Ireland medals they have, they can't relax. Um, they've, they've young girls on the sideline uh, ready, to, ready and willing to take their, their place. Um, so I think that's uh, refreshing and it keeps everyone on our toes and working that bit harder, not only at training, but I suppose off the pitch as well. Um, what you're eating, um, your sleep, hydration, um, your gym sessions, um, you need to be ticking all those boxes if you're going to get a, a place in the starting 15. And everything now is moving towards the All Ireland final against Dublin. Um, obviously, champions the last couple of years. How big a challenge will they be? Yeah, um, I think what we did well going into the Galway game is that we focused on our, our strengths um, and I suppose tried to, to throw everything at Galway and see how they, how they reacted. Um, I think in other years we've we've nearly given the opposition team too much respect and and spent too much time focusing on them. Um, it's definitely I think cost us in the past against um, Dublin. Like we're not naive. We know they're an excellent team and we know the caliber of players they have. Um, but in two weeks' time, I think we will be um, focusing on ourselves and I think that's it. That's exciting because we've huge talent. Um, and I think the teams are really evenly matched. Um, so it, it'll be exciting. And I do think it'll be an unbelievable All-Ireland final. And how much are you enjoying your football at the moment, Darren? You've had your injury problems over the last couple of years, but you, you seem to be kind of coming back to your, some of your best form at the moment. Yeah, um, to be honest, I'm really enjoying football at the moment. Um, that and getting to go to work um, are keeping me sane at the moment. Um, I suppose anyone lucky enough and fortunate enough to be playing inter-county football and um, gets to leave the house a couple of evenings a week and go out and meet your friends and and chat and catch up with them so obviously I'm enjoying it on the field but the social aspect of it is is huge um, given current circumstances um, it is nice to just go out and take our mind off something other than um, how many new cases we have um, so it is look it's refreshing I'm really enjoying football at the moment um, Initially, when I heard 20th of December for All-Ireland final, um, when we heard that initially, I suppose we were all kind of rolling our eyes and had no interest in it. And now that it's two weeks away and we're actually there, we're all really, really excited. Is it surreal to actually think you're going to play an All-Ireland All -Ireland final the Sunday before Christmas Day? Like you have to put away the selection boxes and the roses and all the, all the treats until after and you can hopefully celebrate them. But is it surreal to think that five or six days out from Christmas Day that you're going to play in an All-Ireland football final? I actually had a selection box after the match on, on Sunday. <laughs> um, but it is, it's absolutely mad. Like, even if you go back to Sunday, our match was changed because of ice and frost um, on the pitch. Um, so that's absolutely mad to be thinking you're playing inter-county football on the 20th of December. Um, but look, we're really, really happy the competition went ahead. We're really um, grateful that the LGFA um, facilitated it. Um, and we are really looking forward to it. But as you said, like it's, it is four days before Christmas. So it, it's definitely um, one for the books. Hopefully you'll be talking into another um, selection box after another victorious cock performance in the final. Darren, thank you so much for joining us and best of luck against Dublin. Thanks very much. We're joined now on the podcast by Joe McCarthy, who who was on his way to the Parnell Park last Sunday morning to watch Cork Connection when he got the message that the game had been switched to Croke Park. Um, we've seen the Ferrari the last couple of days, Joe, but talk me through that morning and I suppose the kind of the timeline of events that led from the game going to Parnell Park to Croke Park and then what happened after? Yeah, OK. I mean, first of all, I was, on my, I was in Dublin en route to Parnell Park, like all the media... And I, I don't remember the exact time, Kieran, but it was a good, it was about an hour. I'd say it was between 11 and 12, between coming up to 12 o'clock, anyway, if not before it, uh, when I got a call from a member of the uh, Cork LGFA and they told me, uh, where was I? And I said, I'm on my way to Parnell Park. 
They said, turn around, you or need to switch, you need to go to Crow Park. And I think I tweeted out, so I don't often swear on Twitter because you shouldn't swear on Twitter, but I did. And I said, what the actual, because I just couldn't believe it. And I said, well, why? And they said, the pitch is frozen over. And I said, well, okay, look, these things happen. It's the time of year. But what, what caught me and everyone off guard is that it, it was originally a half one throw in Parnell Park, but now it was a one o'clock throw in, in, in Crow Park. So as I turned away from one direction and started jogging, very slowly uh, down O'Connell, O'Connell Street to get to Crow Park. Luckily, I was within jogging about 20, 25 minutes of it. Um, my head was racing because I was saying, what about the players? What are they going to do? I mean, I knew Cork were overnighting, but I knew Galway also were coming up on the morning of the game. And I was trying to look at Twitter of what was happening and get into the game. Got to the Hogan stand, and I have to say, Crow Park staff on the day were absolutely brilliant. The, the COVID protocols were held up um, unfortunately they didn't have a list when we got there so we were getting texts I was getting texts from people asking me what was happening I was getting emails from the LGFA telling me where to go <laughs> literally as they probably will from now on um, so I went to the Hogan stand was told to go all the way around to the Cusick went all the way around to the Cusick checked in there told to go to a gate went into the gate inside they was told at that gate no you need to go back to the Hogan stand the throw in time was coming pretty quick at this stage so we're pretty stressed with myself and Barbara Carter from 96 of them was with me we got our own got up to the press box was told, we're told you can't use the press box so all the media not that anyone really cares had to sit to the left of the press box in a freezing cold stand with our laptops on our knees with our phones and that around the time the car came out onto the pitch um, I don't know exactly what time it was Kieran, mm-hmm. but there was no sign of Galway and we know from afterwards, obviously, the Galway manager, Tim Rabbit, explained how Galway had just seven minutes of a, of, of a warm-up, which is like, even for a, a junior C football match, seven minutes is nowhere near enough. And we're talking about an, an All-Ireland semi-final here. And like this is rumble on kind of this week, George. It's been on, it's been on, on talk shows, radio, phone-in shows. It's been all over online and so on. Um, the treatment of, the, I suppose, the, the Galway's ladies' team and the Cork ladies' football team, because they were also told very late about the, the venue change. In this day and age, it really, it just isn't good enough. No, it isn't. And what it did was shine a light on, I think somebody made the point last night in one of the talk shows, the radio shows, it's become so professional though. I think Ethy actually might have said it. It's become so professional now in the preparation at the top end of the intercounty. It's passed out the association that's looking after it. And it's, look, you have to be balanced as much as when you criticise an association, you have to balance your, your criticism. This association has delivered live matches via Facebook and on television throughout a pandemic and run it off successfully. But there has been real problems when it comes to sorting a venue for fixtures. Remember, Cork and Galway was originally supposed to be in Limerick and we know why that was moved because the Limerick hurlers needed it. What really has upset people this week? One, the treatment of the Galway team when they came out onto the pitch. A referee whistling at them as they're coming out onto the pitch. You know, I tell you, you've only got six minutes. It's not good enough. Only having seven, and they barely had seven minutes of a warm-up, Karen, because we were looking at it and timing it. As well as that, an announcer telling everybody in Crow Park and empty Crow Park, get off the pitch. Anyone who's not playing. It was like one of those fight seconds jumping in over the ring. Not good enough. And what was really, and has not been good enough, and the LGFA have to own this, is the reaction in the 24 hours after. Sometimes, Karen, as you know in sport, it's better not to say anything until you get your ducks in a row you let everybody else have their say, and then you respond. You do not start issuing statements or coming out on national radio like Marie Hickey did and stating that the Galway team were in the dressing room long enough. Number one, you're only allowed 14 minutes in the dressing room. Everyone is, men, women, everyone at every GA this year. So that's a completely irresponsible thing to say. And she needs to stand over that and apologise to Galway because of what she said. That was totally uncalled for. But if you take a step back for a second, as you said, this is an all-Ireland semi final but it didn't feel like it because so much was happening before either team got out in the pitch changing of venues changing of fixtures I know everybody wants what's best for ladies football but it's time maybe to stop talking about it and acting a bit more professionally when it comes to it and I repeat the NGFA Association have done a huge amount of good work this year can't deny that the way they've gotten live games on their Facebook page and the way Team G have, have covered it but to have no mitigation or risk or plan B if the game couldn't go ahead in Parallel Park and not show it on television 
and then the reaction afterwards. It's just not good enough. And I think the LGFA have to take a bit of time and reflect on the way they reacted to all of this as much as what went wrong. My heart goes out to Tim Rabbit and the, and the Galway players. I think everybody is in unison with that, including Ethan Fitzgerald and the Cork team. They have been absolutely upstanding about the whole thing, not used it as an excuse. Said Cork was a better team on the day. But if you're driving up on the morning of a match and you're rung when you're pretty st- still quite a, w- a well away and you're told to be at the ground for one o'clock, then you're told to be, it's going to be a 10 past one. And then you're shouted at, shouted at on the sideline by LGFA officials to get going, get the game going. How is, that a, how is that a step forward in terms of sport, let alone women's equality? And what I would like to see, but I don't think it's going to happen, there needs to be an inquiry into this, an independent inquiry into what happened so it doesn't happen again. Because everybody's saying it's terrible and it shouldn't happen again. But it will, unless an inquiry is held and somebody is held accountable for what went wrong. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, number one for sport in West Cork. Cork and Nemo Rangers legend Paul Kerrigan announced his retirement from inter-county football last week, bringing the curtain down on a career spanning more than a decade with the Rebels. He was one of the last remaining members of the squad with a senior All-Ireland medal, having been involved in 2010 when Cork beat down. And Kieran, before we talk to him, can you briefly just try and sum up his career for our listeners? Just how good is and was Paul Kerrigan in the Cork jersey? I think you have to look at his longevity, Jack. He was there 13 seasons, which is, um, when you consider the way the game has gone now, it's to, for any player to be 13 seasons at the top level, it's it's some going. We're going back to 2008 when he made his debut, and that was in a, a Munster final against Kerry. And his career is actually bookended by wins against Kerry in the championship, which is a, it, it, it's a nice kind of symmetry to it. There was that 2008 Munster final win against Kerry, and then... Paul came on as a sub in the recent Munster semi-final win against Kerry Parky Cueve. So, um, like you said there too, he's one of the last remaining links to that 2010 team that won the Cork team that won the All Ireland. And he's also, well, he was one of the few um, players left playing senior inter county football who's actually killed across to their name. I was just reading something there earlier in the week that there's only a handful of players, and it's from the Kerry and Donegal teams that won All Ireland um, back in the earlier part of this decade, who are still left playing because. Dublin have been so dominant, they've won everything the last couple of years. So um Paul was one of the last few remaining All Ireland winners around. And he he was he was always a, a nightmare to come up against. When he was in his prime, he was um he was he was fast, he was direct, he could make things happen. Um so it's just it's an end of an era in some ways. And I know Paul is an emo man, and this is a West Cork Sports podcast. We just felt like he's given so much to Cork over the years that it's very important to recognise and have a chat with him. Um because we have to realise too that he's not going anywhere. He's going to still play with Nemo Rangers, like he's going to tell us here. He's open, open for another three or four years there. And he's going to be tormenting West Cork clubs for the next couple of years as well, like he has done over the last decade or so. And Castlehaven fans will be looking forward, or maybe that's the wrong word, looking forward to coming up against him in the County Premier Senior Football Final sometime in early 2021. So um, the good news for, for football fans is that Kerrigan will, will play on with Nemo for the next couple of years. It's um, it's probably no surprise to see him retire from from Cork, Jack. He's I think he's thirty four now, pushing thirty five. So he said himself, the commitment level now is bananas, absolutely through the roof. And he's so much good on in, in his own life. He feels now is the right time to step aside and hand it over to the next generation. And um, he thinks that there's good times in front of this Cork team, but certain things need to happen. So as you'll hear from the chat now, he was in very good form. Um. And, and also, he's very happy with the decision that he's made. Delighted to yep. be joined on the podcast by Paul Kerrigan, who announced his retirement from inter-county football just last week. Uh, Paul, 13 years at, at senior level with Cork. That, that, that's some service. Um, how tough a decision was this to make? Yeah, um, it was tough, to be honest with you. I suppose talking to other fellows who've done it, and they all say the same thing. There's no easy time to do it. So... Uh, very tough but sure look it had to be done and uh, like you go back to being a fan now I was very much a football fan before I got on the panel so it's the same now and uh, I'll be wishing all the lads best luck and I suppose looking forward to going out to Clare you know, next year and having a few points before the game um, and sharing the boys on I was reading a piece there Paul that you were actually contemplating we're stepping back last uh, after the 2019 season so why did you decide to stay on again this year? Yeah I suppose last year I suppose I probably started probably two of our biggest games, let's say, against Kerry and against Dublin. 
uh, and started against Ross Common and came on against Tyrone. So I, I felt like I was playing pretty, had a played a pretty good part. And then I put down a lot of things to I go, let's say, in the club championship. And uh, we'd obviously a successful club championship and I felt I, I went well enough there. So, and that continued on to January. And you know what? I was feeling pretty good. So I said, I uh, continue on. And we, we, before we knew it, we were back in league squads within three or four weeks or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I just went for it. And then um, I suppose it got very elongated, elongated season as a result of the COVID. But, uh, yeah, I suppose that's, that's how I probably stayed at it, I suppose. Was there any one moment... This year, did you thought, no, that's it, no, I, I'm not coming back in 2021. I have my, I have, I have my service done here. Uh, I thought during the COVID, all right, it got a bit, um, I, I know some guys found it refreshing. I found it frustrating, to be honest with you. I prefer being in with the lads very much into the fact that it's a team sport and interacting with people and training with people, even going to the gym with lads or whatever. Um, I suppose we found it a bit monotonous, really, like, you know, you couldn't really travel too far. It was just up to the pitch, up the road, uh, doing your session, doing your running or whatever, doing the gym out the back and log it back to Cork every day. And uh, I suppose I found it tough enough going as there's no outlet to meet lads at night or whatever, like, and, and you know, um, and just go for a kick or go training together. Or, or, you know, like, coming up to the championship, it's hard to beat a good, tough session, do you know what I mean? A good, tough A versus B, maybe a couple of weeks out from championship. And I suppose having that lack of interaction, maybe during that stretch of time was tough. And I suppose you didn't have a clear idea when you were going to be back either. So I suppose just then, but geez, once you got back training, I loved it, to be honest with you. And when you're making a decision like this, deciding to step back, like, is it like, obviously, like you're the person making the decision, but you bounce it off kind of former footballers, friends and stuff. You say, lads, I'm, I'm thinking of, of this. Or are you very much kind of just, you have your own thoughts and, and, and that's it? I would have had very much my own thoughts. I would have said it to a few people. I said, geez, I'd say this is probably my last year and, like, did I say, are you sure? No, are you sure? No, but like, geez, yeah, it's just like I had in my head now that this was definitely my last year. Um, I suppose uh, I found it from, like the kind of most frustrating thing is you're kind of watching games as, as a 25 year old, like in your head, thinking, geez, I could do that, I could run after that, I could go up and down the field all day. But when you're nearly 35, it's uh, can be a bit frustrating when you're going to go out and tr- try play like that. So you have to kind of change your game a bit. And look, I, I had a good run with it, no doubt. Um, First couple of years were unbelievable. The last couple were pretty tough going, but like I, I've been lucky to be a part of a very good team and uh, win uh, as much as a lot of car footballers have done you know, throughout. So I was, I was very lucky. Before we go back to the start, I suppose when you when you kind of first came to light on the Cork senior team, Dennis Hurley, a great man for stats, has sent me a great stat, Paul, and you would actually love him for this one. He said Paul was on the Cork panels with Owen Sexton who was born in 1975, and Cahill O'Mahony, who was born in 1999. So that just shows your longevity st- kind of straight away there. Yeah, yeah, geez, uh, unbelievable. Like, yes, some of the boys now, they're so young, like, uh, you know, sure, like, some of them would barely even probably remember 2010, like, do you know what I mean? So, um, fierce longevity, all right, I suppose. Uh, as I said, like, I got to play with fellas. I really grew up watching playing, like, I was football mad, like, so to play with those lads is unbelievable, and... I suppose it was great to see young lads winning in All-Ireland 20s there now, like last year, and, and, and you look forward to see where, where they end up and where they go. Like So, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a stat, all right, but um, I suppose like if, if you play football for Cork across three decades, like you're going to have a few stats like that. Like, like you kind of mentioned there, you got to play with, with some of your football heroes, and let's go right back. Yeah. I think you, you made your, your, your debut against Kerry in the Munster semi-final back in 2008, and that was a spectacular game as it was. I think Cork were eight points down at, at half-time, but came yeah. back to win by five. What are your own recollections and memories from that day? Yeah, we, and Nicholas Murphy, I think, was sent off early in the second half as well. Um, so we were under a bit of pressure. Um, I suppose that year I was brought in training after the league kind of once a week and then kind of kind of sporadically and I was kind of half thinking of going to America and I remember I was queuing up after training one night for food and Pat Healy was asking me how I was I didn't really know him at all and I said yeah I'm thinking about going away to be honest with you. she goes no no hold on hold on and I ended up staying I made the panel I came on the Munster final came on the all Ireland semi-final so um, yeah the Munster final was unbelievable like as I said it was packed it was a funny kind of day in Parky Cueve it was lashing rain and then it was absolutely roasting for by the full time whistle um, I just thought the boys were uh, just. I thought at half time I was really in awe of them. To be honest with you, know they were under right pressure. Had beat, been beaten the All Ireland final year before. I was up watching it, and they just said like, uh, and like I think it was Derek Cavanagh and maybe Graham or whoever was there, and was just like, look, lads, enough is enough. Like we can't be humiliated here. Like do you know what I mean? After I suppose the All Ireland final where they, where they were beaten by Kerry, and 
they really stood up and um, there was some mass. Obviously, Cusson came on, had a huge impact, got a great goal. But I remember Daniel Goulding got a free and James got a point, both from under the stand. Uh, and it was unbelievable. It was a great day. And like, like as I said, it was my first ever game and a really copper and fast in my love anyway for playing for Cork in anyway, you know, to, to get a win like that in, in, in your debut. Like you were coming into that Cork senior battle, like you'd played a bit behind you, Paul, obviously the All Ireland under twenty one medal and all that. But look, like you, you mentioned there, like Graham Canty, Al, Alan Quirk, Anthony Lynch, Derek Kevin, and Nicholas Murphy, Pierce O'Neill. Like you were coming into this this kind of this supreme team that was on the cusp of something. So, how did you find that jump going from like the under twenty ones into a senior team and then playing with the fellas who, like you said, there you were you were up in Cork Park the year before watching them in, in an in an All Ireland final. Yeah, um, I suppose it's quite different now. Like, you could be very young coming into the senior panels training. Like, there's some lads maybe haven't really played under 20s and they're training with the seniors. You know, back then it was a bit different. I remember I came in when I was under 22, let's say, out of 21. Um, so I had three years done 21 um, and then came into it late in the year next year. And like, Pat Kelly was the same. He was a year older than me, though. So we came in at the same time. And I suppose by the time we were starting championship, I was 22 or 23. He was 24. You know, like, um, so it was quite different. It was a very mature, settled squad, is the way I, I'd see it. Do you know what I mean? Like I know it was, they got a blast of us from under twenty one, uh, who played under twenty one in the in the, the noughties, let's say. But um, they were very mature, really good, honest guys. Really, just they were very settled, and their goal was look. They took their licks along the way, and their goal was just to get over the line and win the All Ireland. And um, maybe they got a bit of a kick out of all of us coming in, um, and but. I, a lot of it was down to them and, and the, the standards they really set. Like it was uh, like it was everything I kind of dreamed of. Really, like it was brilliant. And in your third season as a, as a Cork senior, Cork won the All Ireland twenty ten. Like yeah. that was a that was a, a magical day up in Cork Park, beaten down. Um, what are your own, what are your recollections from that day? Yeah, geez. Um, like from when we came in, it was big day after big day. Really, like massive games year in year out. A lot of league fight. We kind of went up through Division Two, up to Division One, won them in two thousand nine, two thousand and ten, and. We um we actually the All Ireland that year like I think we were the first team to come through the qualifiers with the longest route ever and then won the All Ireland over it. Um, I just felt that day we, I remember vividly like in the hotel that morning we were sitting down in the team room and it was very kind of quiet and relaxed. There was no hollow blue really. I think I remember the, at the time the Hangover the movie was on it was only it wasn't out long so fellas were watching that and just playing a bit of table tennis. So fellas were very relaxed, and I suppose that might have carried into the games. Didn't really start well; they started very well. Um, I just found we couldn't really get a rhythm, and then maybe before half time, Donnie kicked the big point, and it kept us in touch. And then I'd say maybe by ten minutes into the second half, we just got going, and for a lot of it, it was only one team in it. Then maybe up till the seventy minutes, you no know, one we pushed ahead, and they picked. I think we went three up maybe, and they might have got back to a point by the very end, but. Like I felt once we played well, we were going to win. Like, you know, and we played well maybe for kind of 25, 30 minutes in total in the game and, and it was enough. But like at the end of the day, we, I remember during that time, we didn't care about performances, even right through the league games. We just wanted to win every game. So there, like, there was a very mature Cork team, even even with Kenty before the before the throw, you know, kind of Kenty, um, um, obviously didn't, he didn't get to play in the final. Well, he, sorry, he yeah. came on, he didn't start. But um, yeah. like, Cox was that in your stride. Like you weren't rustled by the fact that you're kind of this leader who wasn't starting, you know, you kinda of took everything in your stride that day. Yeah, um I suppose he went off, I think it was towards the end of the Ross Common game. So in the quarter. So we knew he was coming up to the semi, maybe touch and go against the dubs. And I, I think he came off either at half time or before half time against the dubs. So I suppose we were prepared for it, but as I said, there was serious maturity there and like I suppose the, the six backs who started like ugh. Or to try pick one of them to leave out. Do you know what I mean? Like, and and we great quality. And Graham just came on and just really steadied the ship. And and just like a good sub does, just gets you over the line and, and won us the game. Um, so um, he we got a great, great kind of kick. Just surely said the value of the group. Like, um, I think maybe Miskell might have slotted in centre back or whatever. And uh, there was there was no panic really. Like you said, that you were just just on the Cork panel, won an All Ireland, couple of league titles as well. Were you thinking, Jesus, this is great? Kind of like there was so much success, like you know, kind of you thinking it's going to be like this for the next couple of years? Yeah, like you'd be kind of half joking, saying like because we had a good squad, we had good young players, like we had a lot of fellas on the panel who were good players and couldn't really nail down a place in the team yet. So we we're saying, Jesus Christ, we could get you know two or three here, like do you know what I mean? And because it was like we felt, let's say in twenty, like. 
kind of Kerry might have been that great Kerry League team in the noughties were kind of coming to their end a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Um, and like the dubs weren't the dubs yet, and Donegal weren't really on the scene yet either. So like um, we just thought we'd be there thereabouts. But it was, it was a really competitive time. Like to went to a stage there where there was nearly a different team winning the All Ireland for four or five years. Like so, it was um, it was fairly competitive. It actually sounds strange. No, the, 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 hearing you say that a different team winning the All Ireland every year, given yeah, the way yeah. the, the football has gone at the moment. But, but you're dead right, especially back then. Like you'd, uh, you'd I suppose you Tyrone and Armagh in, in the early noughties, and you carried yeah. your car kind of all these good teams competing, and yeah. it was a really good championship. Yeah, like 2009, you had. Uh, Tyrone nine or ten or nine eight Tyrone nine Kerry ten Cork eleven Dublin twelve Donegal like you know so uh, it was fairly competitive at the time and like you still and like we beat Down who were at their best probably Kildare were at their best unlucky not to get to the final do you know what I mean so um, it was fairly kind of competitive back then do you know what I mean so um, compared to now like whereas as I said there was five different winners in five different years and the Dubs have five in a row at the moment like. Going on then, obviously, 2010 was such a huge highlight. And I wrote a piece in the Southern Star um, during the first lockdown about the homecoming in Bentry because um, that was a huge thing down west, down, down west Cork. And yeah. the, what are your own memories of that night? Because by talking to the people who were there, it's like the party went on for a couple of days, but they everyone had a great yeah. time. Yeah, geez. Um, kind of, I remember we met in the Brewery, I think, inside in the city, inside town, and uh, John had to spread on or whatever. And, and then it was a bus down to Bantry, and um, I think our first stop was Dunmanway. Um, for the there was a Sam with the Sam Maguire there, you know, and there was a big crowd in the square, and I just remember being a big crowd in the square and just seeing all people. Then it was just nice to get off the bus and just just meet people, and it was kind of a taste what was to come. And Bantry was supposed to be the next stop, but then we kind of stopped in Drimley, kind of. Um, because it was such a crowd out and they were waving down the bus as far as I can remember. And we went out there, we met people again, went into a pub for a while and again brought the cup and all that. And then down to Bantry, it was, it was class really, to be honest, which was like, um, it was just like up on the stage, the square, it was absolutely packed. Um, and then I remember like after that, a few lads went to, I think, one of the main pubs inside in Bantry. Uh, and then I, I, I was there's a few of us shattered. I remember we snuck off up to a few quiet ones up around the corner and came back down then towards the end of the night. So it was a great, um, it was a great night to answer with you. Like as a fellow from the city, you wouldn't go down to West Cork too often, um, if it wasn't for games and stuff. So it was brilliant. Yeah, and we were back up then for the I think it was the goal match in Parky Ring the following night. So it was a good few days. All right. If when eventually like, long down the line, whenever you hang up your your club boots. And you got to look back and you reflect on, on the highlights of, of your career. Obviously, 2010 is up there. Like, and you can appreciate how much it meant to the people of Cork, all the Cork football fans. Because waiting since 1990, like 20 years, was a long year to wait for that All-Ireland. So everybody, just, they lived they lived that All-Ireland. Like, they really enjoyed it. Yeah, like, and Cork lost to Derry in 93, Mead in 99. Kerry in seven and nine, like so, it was a good few losses along the way, and and like if you can remember as well, like it was kind of the middle of the recession, so it was tough going at the time for people. Do you know what I mean? Like and to, to be coming and supporting us for matches, like it, like I remember Conor Coonan used to always t- put that in us, like that we had no pressure, like there's something as struggling to pay the mortgage or put food on the table the way the economy was. So, um, he was big to emphasise that in us at the time, and uh, yeah, it was brilliant. Like the homecoming was was brilliant as well. Like the bus down from Dublin was just brilliant like great crack and then obviously inside the city and just that week then just just rolled on like it was it was it was unreal yeah like you said fierce competitive at the time and all Ireland's were kind of swapped over the next couple of years you, like Cork was still knocking at the door you were very very close but then I suppose as the years went on different fellas were retiring they were stepping away so there was that that that, that great Cork team went into transition over a couple of years and the success didn't flow as freely then no, like uh, I'd say 12 when we lost to Donegal, we were really lifting again. Like I thought, you, know, you can feel it during the year. I thought this was this, this was going to be our year again. Like we were really going well, um, really fit, really competitive, playing great football. And then obviously we ran into Donegal, and that was their year. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, really unfortunate. But um, yeah, and then after that, 2013, an awful lot of the boys were finished up or whatever, just how it happened. And the team went for, as I previously said, a very mature and settled team. The very, very kind of the age profile almost completely shifted. Do you know what I mean? Like it, I was nearly one of the older fellas at that stage, and I was only in my mid twenties. Like do you know what I mean? Kind of so it changed a good bit, and it was just it was just constant kind of. I found upheaval anyway for the next couple of years. We just couldn't get any rhythm. Do you know what I mean? It was 
three different managers, six S and C coaches. You know, it was just that I know that's all off field stuff, but it's very hard. And I found there's a lot of a lot of turnover in players as well constantly every year. You know, there could be five, six, seven lads gone only after a year there, and it's very hard to build kind of morale or build momentum there. Like we had a few good leagues and a few handy days in championship, but we never really hit the heights in championship. Then I thought after, which was quite disappointing. Like. Is it hard for a player then, Paul, like yourself, who, like I said, came in at the start, had such great success, then all of a sudden that success was gone and you were gone from a young fella now to one of the leaders of the team, given given the turnover of players. So how did you find that transition to become a leader in a team that wasn't as going as well as, as you obviously wanted it to be? Yeah, I found it a bit it was a bit different. Like, um, I think when the young fellas came in, Brian Cuthbert was the manager, he he had a lot of those lads in minor. And I suppose he, I thought he... Like he put the emphasis on the young fellas really to try and make them feel as comfortable as possible and maybe expected us to just tip away and leave a bit more ourselves. Whereas um, I thought he could, like maybe could have pushed us a, bit, a little bit more to lead the team. Like I, I found it might be myself or Daniel Goulding or something like that. We're in over the team a good bit. Now you know the right to find right to be in the team. But um, you know, it was just a kind of, I just found even my form was a bit more inconsistent around then and, you know, I, I would like to be a fella to be given too much advice if I'm not backing it up myself. You know, so um, yeah, I suppose. And then I, once I got comfortable after that, then I felt like I could grow into it a little bit. But um, as I said, we just went kind of uh, like with so many new players, you're trying to find a new team. Then, like, do you know what I mean? Um, and it's just it's very kind of hard maybe to to really push on and, and win all learn like that. I think anyway, you have to be really you look at the dubs and and. The good Mayo team in the last couple of years, they were fairly settled. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, like the Dubs or the Mayo were building, they beat us in 2011 and they built right through that decade now, like, and they're only finished up now, like, still without an All Ireland. So it's hard to do it, like, do you know what I mean? Like you said, kind of, that there was such upheaval in Cork football at the time in terms of the turnover of players, and there were so many players used. And it's only kind of now in the last 18 months that, um, that the ship is pointed in the right direction, kind of. I know, look back to 2019 in the Super 8s and you're probably sick of hearing about moral victories, but it, yeah. it, it, it was a sign still, Paul, that, that, that like, there were better days that didn't have gone, like, go back to 2018 and that, that game against Kerry, then we go to later against Tyrone, like, that, that was a pretty yeah. low moment. But, like, the past 18 months have been a lot more encouraging. Yeah, like, and I think, as I said, it's gone a little bit settled, like, Ronan now showed great faith in the likes of Killian O'Hanlon, Maddie Taylor, Rory Dean, uh, Brian Hurley, uh, John O'Rourke, Mark Collins, and Ian McGuire, like, they, like they, like, like they've been kind of almost um, ever present under him. Like, do you know what I mean? And I know it's kind of starting to supplement with some of the young fellas coming in, stuff like that. So, like, he is his core, um, and like, and then he's other guys trying to push and get into that, which is good. Like, um, as I said, I, I would say I know we had a few moral victories or close games, um, and I thought the Kerry game was fantastic. We we done exactly what we wanted to do in the league, win every game. Uh, and then it was just a pity, like the way, like you said, I know probably a lot of people feel like it's gone back to square one maybe after the tip game, but I would say, anyway, from the group of lads inside there, like definitely, let's say the floor is a bit higher. Do you know what I mean? Like they're not, we're not falling as far back, as far down as maybe previous times. Like I think the lads will bounce back straight away, and I know they'll probably be back in pre season in um, probably nowhere the next week or two or whatever, like I'd say to do a little bit. So, um, as I said, I I know they're they're it's it's a tough result to take, but as I said, I wouldn't like we were fairly rock bottom a few times, and I don't think we're rock rock bottom now at the moment with with the quality of lads in there. Like I I think my own opinion that that game against Tipperary should be taken in isolation because in in the last eighteen months the Cork football team has shown a consistency that had been missing the couple of years before that. So kind of we hadn't seen a performance like that from Cork go back to probably twenty eighteen. So that tip game should be taken in consistency. And I'd, I'd prefer to look at the semi-final against Kerry because that showed the potential, Paul, of this Cork team. Yeah, like, it's it's funny. Like, well, a lot of the lads who were there a couple of years have, have very rarely strong wins together. Like, and like, do you know what? Maybe winning Division 3 and playing Leicester opposition gave lads that confidence just to start winning games. Like, because the last couple of years we hadn't won a home game or we were struggling to win home games. We hadn't put two back to back wins together in the league in a long time so look they got them out of the way um, and then like the, I suppose the, it's funny like the, I suppose as a Cork footballer you get the complete high and the complete low in a month do you know what I mean like massive criticism and massive praise like I suppose they were praised for being very patient against Kerry which they were and then kind of criticised maybe for being too lateral against Tip do you know what I mean so no, 
I thought we didn't penetrate at all against Tip up front. Um, John and the whole team was answer for that. But yeah, look, I, as I said, I think I think there's a good group of lads there, and if they're they kind of the big thing is they all want to get better. Like they want a good coaching, they want good S and C. Um, you know, they they want to be playing the best teams, and I'd say look, I think I think hopefully you now next year will be a big test for them in Division Two. So we'll see how they get on there. Is it key so, Paul, that there is a consistency there? Like you mentioned there, go back four, five, six years, different SNC coach, different managers, different players, and everything was, everything was, and there's so many moving plates. But at the moment, it is a lot more consistent than, than it has been. So if Carr can keep that consistency and building it, that should see improvement. I know it's not that straightforward, yeah. but. Yeah. Uh, I'd, and I'd say a lot of them probably want it. Like I said, they're very happy now with the, it was Kevin Smith, strength and conditioning, and Keen O'Neill's first year coaching. Like, and I, I, I was very happy myself and I know a lot of, all the lads probably were too so I'm sure they'd definitely like that again like next year do you know what I mean like and they felt like I suppose you could see them against Kerry and, and in the league some of the improvements that they were trying through let's say um, and it paid off a bit against Kerry and it was only our first year of it and, and basically only six or seven weeks of intense stuff after the club championships like so I think I definitely think players probably want that little bit of consistency to be honest with you um, I'd say the old lads are just probably sick of all the changing and uncertainty and I know from speaking some of the 20s they were very happy with the, the setup that they came into to be honest with you You have a, a great record to finish on in some way you started winning, winning against Kerry and you came on in, in your last game it was also kind of a, yeah. a the one to semi-final win against Kerry talk to me about that kind of that um that relationship with Kerry over the years kind of obviously Cork and Kerry fierce rivals you, you've had some good days against them some bad days against them yeah, like as I said, being a fan, like I always just remember Killarney, like going down as a young player or whatever with my parents and going down then as a supporter, like just Clarney and Crow Park would be the two. Like, no, we never got a win on Clarney, we got a couple of questionable draws, to be honest with you, I think. Um, uh, but like they were the big days, like, you know, if I remember my starting first time kind of really in championship, the first big game was 2009 against um, against Kerry and Clarney, Mark and Tomas O'Shea, like, and you know, it was. I I just I can still remember going into the the ground like and generally it was piping hot down there playing them like it was real championship stuff. Uh, I kind of felt a lot of the times I done well enough then on Clarny as well like do you know what I mean so I I have kind of um make fond memories of just being a player and playing in those big games down there. Um, I suppose we never got to beat them down there or beat them in Crow Park which I know probably sticks with a lot of fellas like but um we we still had a really good rivalry at the time like you know it was. It was, it was fairly good at two answers you're playing against against some of Kerry's best ever players with, with Cork some probably Cork's best ever players as well like. Cork came so close a couple of years back Fionn Fitzgerald's Hail Mary point or he's passing in the last couple of seconds the night Cork like yeah, that was like, a... yeah like that, and before that even Brian Sheehan I think 2009 got a last minute free I think Colin Cooper got a last minute free another year like you know so well, I suppose we should have people probably say we should have finished it out and we definitely would have a chances, but it's just it's just unfortunate. Like I felt, we probably didn't get the rub of the green in those days either. So um, yeah, I suppose we we regret that uh, probably uh, that group. But look, there were still good memories like that. You can look back on now that you were playing at that operating at that kind of level. Like hopefully by the time next summer rolls around, that we're in a lot different environment to what we are now. And if it is Cork and Kerry, it'll be down in Clarny, and you'll be there on, on the terrace in in in, in Clarny. Hopefully all going well. But looking to next year. Life without senior intercounty football for you, Paul. Like it's been a routine for 13 years, and suddenly that routine of that senior intercounty um, environment is gone. How are you going to approach that? Are you going to look to try and fill that time? Have you Netflix series lined up? Have you anything, any different hobbies you're going to pursue in 2021? Yeah, I suppose I, I won't be watching too much telly anyway. I'd, I'd like to be out and about, to be honest with you. Um, it is going to be hard, I think. I suppose, in, in terms of me, I'm lucky to be with a very successful club, and we, we're generally have been at the business end of the championship and I suppose we've been involved in all learning club series and I've missed a couple of leagues because of it so I think I'll be all right that time of year I just think maybe the maybe the kind of month or so before a championship I'd probably miss that I'd say when things are ramping up and you know you're putting the finishing touches on it and you know you're getting really fit and and really well prepared and, and you're really counting down to those gate that uh, that big day I suppose that's when I'll probably probably miss it the, the most probably in April April maybe coming up to there and and look, I suppose, look, I, I missed the games too, but I'll get used to it. Uh, I suppose other things, I suppose I can probably play a little bit more golf, I suppose I'd like to get into uh, and just maybe socialise a bit more down the club and see what I can bring to the club. I'll be there now for the 
for the, the long haul rather than just coming in after after uh, Cork games and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I suppose if I to keep me busy anyway, I'll I'll uh, I'll work away and I suppose just to try and enjoy myself and try to train hard and even set a good example there as, well, as long as I can. So the Cork lads fancy themselves as golfers. Will you be hoping to get some of them out of the course? Oh no, geez, some of them you couldn't trust at all. I've been playing thing with them. Uh, Mark Collins now, Colin O'Neill, these kind of fellas like God only knows what they'd be up to. Uh, <laughs> so um yeah, no, I'll 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 definitely catch up. I'll be catching up with a few ex teammates now this weekend, all right. Uh so that, it's it's nice to be able to do that as well. I suppose I'm the last of let's say that crew, like so it'd be nice to meet up with them and uh and see how they're getting on, and and, uh, and and maybe do it a little bit more often, you know, and hopefully at the end of the month we might be doing something with the 10 2010 crowd again. So um, we'll see how we get on. Is the hope so, Paul, that by kind of hanging up your inter-county boots now, that you might be able to kind of even get a few extra years with Nemo, you get that bit of longevity with the club now? Yeah, like, um, I suppose I've touched wood very rarely been injured. Um, I'm coming out for Nemo in pretty good health, do you know what I mean? Like, so... I don't generally miss training too often or, or, or something like that. So um, I think, like, yeah, I, I, um, I'd be hopeful enough of getting a good, at least three years anyway, do you know what I mean? Like, see how we get on. And, um, and I think we have a good squad, so um, hopefully to be continued success with them. But it, it is t- it's getting better in the co- county championship now, to be fair, I think. Like, so the Haven, and Ballon and and... and um, and the bars are are serious teams, like so. Uh, I think it is getting quite competitive in the county championship, and the, the new format has helped that as well. I don't know if it's good news or bad news for West Cork teams that you're around for another, another couple of years to torment them in the county championship. That will that will start with with Castlehaven in the in the Premier Senior yeah. Final in 2021. But Paul, you've been a, absolutely brilliant for for giving us so much time. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Congrats on a super inter county career, and no doubt we'll see plenty of you in an emo jersey in the Southern Star over the next couple of years. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks very much and happy Christmas. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, number one for sport in West Cork. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. And as always at this time before we wrap up the show, Kieran is going to give us a sneak preview of what we can expect in this week's Southern Star Sports section. And Kieran, I imagine there's a lot on the Cork ladies footballers and what went on around that game last weekend. Yeah, it's our front page news this week, of course, the fallout from from what we discussed earlier in the podcast. But um, also, too, we have two pages on the game itself because we can't forget that the Cork ladies are true to the All-Ireland final against Dublin on on December 20th. So that is something to look forward to in the next couple of weeks. Plenty going on at, at this time of the year. I have an interview with Bobby O'Dwyer, the Cork Minor football manager, because the Cork Miners are out against Kerry in a Munster semi-final next Tuesday night. And there's a lot of West Cork interest in this minor team and we've um, the names of all those players and that's in this week's ter- this week's Southern Star. We also I've also caught up with Karen Cohan, the Corsi Rovers Camogie captain. She received the West Cork Sports Star Monthly Award last week for, for leading courses that are first ever county senior camogie championship. So I had a chat with Karen about her career and her journey and kind of always when you sit down and talk to these people, Jack, you get interesting stories and and Karen is actually a Kinsale woman who joined Corsi's when she was 12 or 13, and that's, you know, more courses woman than a Kinsale woman. So um, good stuff there from Karen. We've also full coverage from the recent Carberry GAA GM and their, I suppose, the reaction of the local clubs to Rebels Bounty, the new draw that's brought in. And also we have an interview with Tim Buckley, the Carberry senior football manager, who is staying on for another year um, in 2021. So he's setting his stall out quite early, Jack, kind of... Um, what his plans are for next year and so on. He's hoping to build on the progress that the footballers made this year in terms of preparation. The result against UCC didn't go their way. But at one stage, Carberry had 60 players involved in their in their senior football programme, which um, which is good, good for the future. On top of that, St. Columns celebrated their 50th anniversary on December 8th, on, on, on Tuesday this week. So we have a full page on St. Columns re- t- reaching that landmark. We have also West Cork League news about the possible return return dates and so on. So as you can see from that, Jack, there's a lot going on in this week's Southern Star Sports section. Absolutely. And if you can't make it to the shops on Thursday, you can also pick up a copy of the Southern Star Digital Edition and read it for less than €2 Euro per week on your computer, tablet, or a smartphone, just go to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e paper. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast. 
We'll be back at the same time next week. If you enjoy these shows, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or YouTube. Slán